One of the things that you will have uh, noticed kind of on the world scene is the, the shifting point of gravity for Christianity. In the past, it's been the West, the Western churches have been the churches that have grown. But in recent years, there's been quite a, a seismic change and the Western churches are actually going into decline, while the, the non-Western churches, particularly Africa, India, China, South America, are booming. I was reading a survey the other, oh, well, Saturday, yesterday, uh, put out by Lifeway, which many of you may be familiar with. It's one of the, the biggest uh, resource uh, ministries in America. Um, Beth Moore and a lot of other uh, well-known people uh, supply all their DVDs, teaching materials and everything through this organization. And they said they've, they've conducted surveys recently and almost 200 churches a week are closing in the United States. You know, there are hundreds in the UK, hundreds of churches closing and are offset by the rising of mosques. So this is what's happening in our world. <clears throat> so there are two things I, I wanted to do this morning, and that is to just identify what I believe is the main cause for the decline in the West, and then secondly, to think of what our response is as we are here, we are starting a new church, and we have our own harvest field. We can't affect what's happening in continents, but we can affect our own environment where God has placed us, where God has placed you, where God has placed this church, that there are things, principles that we can put in place that will bring great empowerment uh, to what we're doing as we seek to move ahead into the harvest. So let me just turn this on. Every little gadget's got its own buttons. So, let me go so <clears throat> empowering the harvest is my subject, and hopefully the Lord will speak to you and, and show you practical and spiritual ways that you can bring empowerment to wherever God has placed you. I came across a good little quote that says, bloom where God has planted you even if it's in a lily pond. <laughs> so wherever God's planted you, he's given you the opportunity, the giftedness, to bloom and to bring empowerment to that part of his harvest field. Identifying what's causing the, the decline of, of the church in the West, I, I believe the greatest cause is the confusion over what is the gospel. There's been tremendous fragmentation of the church over the last few hundred years in the West. Do you know how many denominations there are? Last survey showed 45,000 denominations, plus another 30,000 independent streams. So there's been tremendous like, fragmentation uh, across the, the evangelical church with really no agreement on, on this question, what is the gospel? How do we understand the gospel? And so every group has come up with its own definition, its own approach, its own methodology, its own message. And many of them fall into the category of easy belief. They have so simplified the gospel, they've made it so easy to claim to be a Christian that those who enter the gospel, enter the church, on, on the basis of this easy belief, simply do not last. And we'll see 
many churches, the back door is wider than the front door. People are coming in, but in time, there's nothing of substance, there's nothing that really is, is spiritually dynamic, and so they slip out the back door and go looking for something else. I've heard many uh, approaches to evangelism, that you can become a follower of Jesus by being baptized, by taking the sacraments, by filling out a membership form, by telling Jesus in your heart, I'm now a follower. Um, I've heard altar call where it says, just tell Jesus in your heart, I'm in. And so people have never been confronted with the most basic, fundamental, powerful verse in the New Testament, you cannot enter the kingdom unless you are born again. There's an unwillingness to present a message in, in many quarters that confronts people with the need to be born again, to go through repentance, confession, the filling of the Holy Spirit, a life of discipleship, a life of sacrifice, that is all minimized in order to make Christianity attractive. I saw one survey that identified reasons people attend church. Number one, friendliness, 25%. Second, children. Children are important. Children's programs, 25%. Music, 18%. Sermon, 14%. Pastor, 14%. So here we have 70 odd percent of the reason for coming to church is in that category friendliness, children, and music. Now, it's tragic that so many people in church consider themselves Christian. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. They may have had their social needs met, their psychological needs met, but they have never had a living encounter with Jesus Christ. And I long for the day when when I personally am more Christ-centered than I am, and long for the day when our churches are Christ-centered And I want to inspire you, stir you by reading part of a prayer from an old black preacher many years ago. In the early 80s, I had the opportunity to meet J. Oswald Sanders, who was a very well-known mission leader around the world, uh, Overseas Missionary Fellowship, I think it was with, um, missionary statesman, a member of the Hillsborough Baptist Church, and I asked him to be my mentor, one of my mentors. And so in the last year of his life, I had many times with him to share and to pray. And on one occasion, he pulled out this old tape, old cassette tape, that had been made um, in the 50s, I think, in the last century. And it was, it was an old black preacher from the States. And it was a prayer that, that he had prayed <coughs> And it was so powerful that um, J. Oswald Sanders and I just sat there, looked like the hair on, on the head was, was rising up. It was so powerful. And I, I've always hoped that I'd come across the written form of this prayer. And towards the end of Chuck Misler's Through the Bible in 24 Hours, I found the prayer. And so I want to share some of it with you. It's not the whole prayer because it would take too long. But you've got to put yourself in the context of sitting in the, in the church and, and this big black guy is up there and he is just powerful in his prayer as he's inspiring the, the congregation by bringing out the, the incredible nature of Jesus our Savior and how we can so often just minimize uh, Jesus instead of him being everything to us individually and, and corporately. So here, is, uh, here are some extracts from this prayer. 
Our coming king is the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, the king of all ages, the king of heaven, the king of glory, the king of kings, and lord of lords. He is a prophet before Moses, a priest before Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua, an offering in the place of Isaac, a king from the line of David, a wise counselor above Solomon. The heavens declare his glory and the firmament shows his handiwork. He who is, who was, and always will be, the first and the last. He is the Alpha and Omega, the A and the Z. He is the first fruits of them that slept. He is the I am that I am, the voice of the burning bush. He is the captain of the Lord's host, the conqueror of Jer Jericho. He is enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He is immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of very God. He is our kinsman redeemer, and he is the avenger of blood. He is the city of refuge, our performing high priest, our personal prophet, our reigning king. Wow, how many of us pray like this? His offices are manifold, his reign is righteous, his promises are sure, his goodness is limitless, his light is matchless, his grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's irresistible. He's invincible. Wow. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Man cannot explain him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him and they learned they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find fault with him. The witnesses couldn't agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him, death can't handle him, the grave can't hold him. He has always been and always will be. He has no predecessor and no successor. You can't impeach him and he's not going to resign. His name is above every name and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever Amen. Wow, what a prayer. Amen. What a prayer. It's incredible. I've got some copies of the full prayer available after the service here if you're interested. But it just, to me, you know, highlights that when we fail to make him central, when we, when we fail to focus on him, our relationship with him, Individually and as a church, it's no wonder that people just walk in and out of churches. Amen? Jesus is almost an add-on to the programs and the schedules and the meetings uh, that all have their place, but they don't centralize Jesus. And so whole sections of our society are denied any understanding of who Jesus really is. And not to mention the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, to, to centralize on Jesus means all these other things fall into place. And we could spend a long time just talking about that the blessings, the empowerment that comes through the Spirit that if we don't emphasize are overlooked and it means that the, that the, the harvest is just withering, withering in the fields. The Spirit... He indwells us. He gives us assurance of salvation. He enables us to speak in tongues. He opens our understanding to the things of God. He imparts spiritual gifts. He teaches and guides. He imparts renewal. He produces Christ-like fruitfulness, strengthens the believers in a being, empowers the believers to pray, gives us specific callings for ministry, and brings about eventually the resurrection and immortality to our bodies. Amen? The work of the Spirit, again, is, is held back from people. They don't know the dynamic either of Christ or the Spirit. Now, the, the question is this. Do the Scriptures actually predict, prophesy, that there will be a time when parts of the church either stagnate or start to shrink? And I, I believe there is. 
And I agree with, with many scholars who see a real prophetic message in Jesus' letters to the seven churches. Just to remind you what those churches were. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven churches that Jesus wrote to. He made a, a revelation to John to write down these letters, and then these letters were delivered. This is the order that they were delivered as the couriers went around Asia. Now, in a way, the, the letters were report cards because in the letter, it had a section of commendation, of praise, of, of appreciation for what they're doing, and then there can be some rebuke um, identifying areas where the church is failing. And so when we look at the letters, we find Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, and Philadelphia all got positives. There was a lot of things going on that were commended by Jesus. However, Sardis and Laodicea got a negative report. A harsh report, particularly for Laodicea. And here's a section of that letter. Jesus says, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow, what a report. Not quite as bad as the reports I used to get at primary school, but um, terrible report. And we could sum it up by saying what they had focused on, what they had become, developed as affluence, half-heartedness, self-confidence, spiritual blindness to their real condition, and a focus on deeds. Says, I know your deeds, I know your activities, I know your programs, but spiritually they don't mean anything. And I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. What a harsh, harsh statement from Jesus. But he was thoroughly sick of their behavior. Now this is where we get to the interesting part because I believe these letters describe the condition of the church, Christianity, over the last 2,000 years. And we could look at this. That Ephesus represents the apostolic church. The church in the first 100 years that was built by the apostles, most of the apostles were, were alive towards the end, getting towards the end of the century. And the church was in a tremendously healthy state, signs and wonders, the gospel was going out. The known world was being turned upside down. The Roman Empire was becoming affected. This is a very significant, powerful um, era of the church. And then Smyrna, the persecuted church. By now the Roman Empire had had enough of Christianity and they were persecuting the church very severely and um, unknown numbers of Christians were killed. Then Pergamos represents the compromised church. The church by the, around the year 500 had become very uh, secularized, very materialistic. <clears throat> a lot of cults had, had um, developed. And uh, a lot of holy men and women actually fled into the wilderness. They set up monasteries. They wanted to get away from the, the, um, the, the church structures because of the secularization that had taken over. By 1000 AD, Thyatira represents the state church. This is the uh, church that was led by the Catholics. By now it had become very um, political, um, become very um, legalistic, and it gave rise to the Reformation, 
and the birth of the denominational churches. And we see uh, after Martin Luther and others had um, successfully begun the, the Reformation, that the main denominations, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, um, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, all these denominations sprung up after that time. And this, um, this got approval. This, this had a tick. The report card for them, you might remember, was a positive one. And then Philadelphia... was the missionary church. Around the uh, 1800s and so on, we had the rise of the, the, the missions, uh, great missionaries, William Carey, um, David Livingston, all these famous missionaries went out into Africa, India, China, uh, South America, the South Pacific, John Williams, extraordinary missionary down to the South Pacific. And um, this was a really uh, positive time in, in the life of the church. And then finally, we get to Laodicea, which is the apostate church. Apostate means um, full of false teaching, easy believe, um, affluent. Um, when Claire and I were in uh, Singapore, we were, um, I was teaching a number of students who, who belonged to a church that built a new complex, they, they don't grow in their, their, their former building. You know how much they spent on the building? 400 million on the building, 7 million on the sound and the lighting. But a mark of the apostolic church is also to, uh, apostate church is also to avoid topics like sin, repentance, holiness. Chuck Misler points out that the, the word Laodicea actually means control. It's churches that are controlled. A human control. Now there's an amazing statement in, in the letter to Laodicea. And this is very often used for evangelism. I've used it myself. Here I am, Jesus standing at the door. Holman Hunt's famous painting. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And as I say, it's usually used for evangelism, altar call, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart, open your heart and let him in. That's a secondary meaning. The primary meaning was to the church. Jesus is saying to the church, I'm standing at the door knocking. Well, Jesus can't get into his own church. And that's true of many churches in the West. Jesus cannot get in because of human control and because fear that people will be uh, discouraged um, and not participate you know, in the life of the church. Now there's a, a passage in Matthew that completely repudiates every easy way, every easy message. And it's a picture Jesus uses of two gates. Enter into the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. The word for life here is zoe, which means physical life, natural life, but also spiritual life. A narrow gate that leads to life and a broad, wide gate that leads to destruction, both physical and spiritual. Now we notice that neither gate has a sign on it. There's no destination above the gate. People have to work out for themselves where this road, where this path is going to go. And we know as we look around us that many choose the broad way because it, it seems to be the way of prosperity, the way of happiness, the way of pleasure, uh, all these things that are attractive to people. Um, and the devil, of course, is the master of deception, the second 
Corinthians 11.14, it says he can appear as, as an angel of light. And so the, 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 the broad gate is covered with glittering lights. You know, like driving into um, Las, uh, Las Vegas. You know, it's all glitter, all light. It's so attractive that people don't spare a glance at the small gate. I'm always intrigued with this, that to our surprise, we find that the small gate is hard to find. Now, this is incredible because the scripture says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And elsewhere it says, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So you'd think it would be easy to find because God wants everybody saved, amen? Why would he make it hard? The gate, of course, is Jesus. Jesus stands at the gate. And he's the reason that people turn away, don't press in, don't make an effort, because the price is too high. Jesus says, make every effort. The Greek word is agonize. And it's a word used elsewhere in the New Testament for athletes who are striving to win. They give everything they have, everything they can, in order to win the prize. And so to enter in the narrow gate takes all the energy, all the commitment, all the determination that we have we can't just enter on our own terms, walk through carrying a suitcase. Paul says, work out your salvation, what? With fear and trembling. There's an effort, there's a dedication, there's a commitment, there's a process of repentance, confession, and breaking with the old life, dealing with demons that have harassed us and brought things, habits into our lives, um, for which now we need to be set free. And so some of the marks of a a Christian community that will empower your harvest within your sphere of influence. We all have a sphere of influence. Where we live, where we work, family, friends, relatives, everyone is unique. So rather than look at the world, thinking how can I change the world, first of all we look at ourselves, make sure I'm Christ-centered, spirit-filled, and then do what I can with the, God, with the gifts that God has given me, the opportunities that God has given me, within my sphere of influence. So I've identified a few things all around Christ. And the first one is in Christ. Would you say that with me? In Christ. In Christ, the Word. Now some years ago I was able to spend six weeks up in Irian Jaya, which is now Papua, working with missionaries there in the Balian Valley with the Dani tribe. Now, the Danis were the most primitive tribe, group of people on the earth. It was still Stone Age. People literally chopping wood with stone axes. And most of the people were consumed with um, killing each other, Getting, uh, stealing territory off each other, stealing the gardens off each other, um, just using bows and arrows. And the missionaries got established, they, they learned the language, and then they started to preach. And this, is what, this was their message. We come to you preaching God your creator. That sounds logical, doesn't it? We come preaching God your creator. We're going to show you how all this came to be. What was their answer? We are not created. We came up out of the river. And the missionaries couldn't break through on this um, concept of creator. They kept working away with the language, the written language, and then they eventually started to translate some of the Gospels into the local language. And as soon as the people began to hear the, the word of Jesus through the scriptures, they turned to him. Suddenly their eyes were opened. Suddenly now there was a spiritual dynamic that opened their eyes. And so the churches started to grow. 
the point for us, of course, it's, it's the revelation of the word that empowers us, both individually and, and corporately. It's the rhema word, the living word, not just the retelling of, of Bible stories or, or teaching Bible morals. It's the living word that comes alive through Jesus. It's, it's because we're in him that he can speak to us. You follow? And most of you know I have an incurable bone marrow problem. Um, three years ago, I was um, given three to five years. But during that time, God has, has tremendously encouraged me, empowered me, inspired me to do what I can do for, for the kingdom, for the harvest, by giving me words of encouragement from the scripture, words that come alive, pas passages I've read before that suddenly come alive. For example, just last week, I was reading Isaiah 54.10, where it says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. I thought that's really encouraging. And then I really felt the Lord saying to me, put your name in it, put your name in it, and then it will become yours. So I read it again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you, John William Kirkpatrick, will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Suddenly it became alive. See, it doesn't matter what's happening around us. When the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. So that's one sphere in which we can change and power the harvest where we are planted, that we are in Christ the word. And secondly, through Christ our mediator. Would you say that with me? Through Christ our mediator. Now, most of us finish our prayers by saying, in Jesus' name. Um, if you're a, a full-on Pentecostal, you'll probably shout that. In Jesus' name. Um, not that I think the volume makes any difference at all. But we, we do pray in Jesus' name. And I think many new believers could be puzzled. Does God only answer prayer that's made in Jesus' name? Why doesn't God just deal, deal directly with us? Um, is this some sort of formula that we've got to pray, like in Jesus' name? No. The point is that God always acts through Jesus. He acts through Jesus. He, it was through Jesus that he created the universe. It was through Jesus he sustains the universe. He reveals himself to us. God saves us through Jesus. He relates to us by spirit through Jesus. He sustains our relationship with God through Jesus. It's through him. God does everything for us through Jesus. He is our mediator. He's our great high priest. He intercedes. Everything we have from God comes through Jesus. See, and that's why we can declare with our, with our um, black saint in America, he's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's irresistible, he's invincible. Everything comes to us through Christ. Often we're looking for other means of supply, resource, strength, encouragement, but it's through Christ that we're going to receive everything that God has for us. So, in Christ, through Christ, and then on Christ. Did you say that? On Christ, our foundation. Now, many Christians have an urgent need to understand this because they've come into the church on the basis of an easy believe message and they're not sure whether they're saved or not. And a number of well-known Christians actually are becoming Roman Catholics because the Catholics will guarantee salvation if you keep the seven sacraments. But saving faith is resting faith. It, retire, it depends entirely, relies entirely on Jesus. Excuse me. I just have a little problem. You may have noticed. Please ignore it. Um, there was a famous missionary, John Patton, who was born in Scotland in the early 1800s. He studied theology and then um, medicine. He went to the New Hebrides Islands as a missionary. He was only there three months when his wife and her five-year-old baby died. 
He then had to flee for his life to another island, and he served there for 15 years. Much of this time, he was working on translating John's Gospel. And if you're familiar with John's Gospel, John uses um, the, the word um, pieces, Greek word, which means believe, trust, put your trust in, put your faith in. And he couldn't find any word in the local language that de described this. And th then one day, he's sitting in this, his room where he's doing his translation, and he said to his translator, what am I doing? And the translator said, sitting in the chair. He said, okay. So he took his feet off the floor, tipped his chair right back and said, now what am I doing? And the translator said, you're leaning with all your weight. And John Patton said, that's it. That is my word for trusting and believing in Christ, that he is our foundation. We put all our weight on him. That's trusting him. When we totally, unconditionally put our trust, put our belief in him, that he will strengthen us, he will empower us, he will build higher and wider in us and through us. Amen? So a Christ-centered life and ministry in church, in Christ, through Christ, on Christ, and now under Christ. You know, nobody likes the idea of being under somebody. Now, society is beginning to arrest authority. They don't like police. They don't like school teachers. They don't like anyone in authority, politicians. Some years ago, I was at a pastor's retreat. It was an ecumenical movement. We'd set the day apart, a group of guys from, from the same city. And uh, after we'd had our, our morning tea, we settled down to study, to um, share, communicate with each other. And um, the chairman said, well, we, we've got to have a subject. Like, we can't just sit here and do nothing. Let, let's choose something that is going to be meaningful to us all. So someone said, well, we, we've all got a lot of differences. We've got similarities, but a lot of differences. Why don't we start with something we all agree on and then we'll go from there. We'll see how far we can take it. See how far we can take our unity. So that was a good idea. So someone said, well, I'll, I'll start by saying, Jesus is Lord. We'll start there and we'll build on that. Do you know, we could not get agreement on Jesus is Lord. For two and a half hours, we debated whether we can actually say in today's world, Jesus is Lord. And the majority said it was a negative term. It speaks of submission, it speaks of uh, oppression, it, it speaks of colonialism, and Claire will tell you, I came home so depressed. <laughs> we were the spiritual leaders of the town, and we couldn't even say together, Jesus is Lord. But that's where he has placed us. He's played us under his feet. We are under him. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. We are his servants, amen? We will never be equals. We will always be servants. We'll always be under Christ. And as we put ourselves under Christ, we find security. We find freedom. We find release. We find as we submit our wills to him, he gives us the best, more than we ever uh, considered. He is our Lord. And he shows us the realm in which we live is his kingdom. I love it where in, in Philippians, it talks about through the cross, he was put over everything. And then in Ephesians, it says how everything was put under him. And these two just complement each other. God's order is that Christ is over and we are under. Amen? That's where we will thrive. If we're always looking for independence to do it our way, you know, I just hate that song Frank Sinatra became famous for. I'll do it my way. I'll just cut that off wherever I hear it, unless it's on some public loudspeaker system and I've got no control. But I, I just hate it because that's an attitude that a lot of Christians can have. I'll do it my way. 
in Christ, through Christ, on Christ, under Christ, and then finally, towards Christ. Can you say that with me? Towards Christ. Now, I need to make a confession that I don't really like reading biographies or autobiographies. I much read, uh, for read you know, Christian books on theology or church growth or something, but when I do pick up a biography, I usually speed to read through it to see what made the person tick. Someone gave me as a Christmas present a book on Steve Jobs, you know, from uh, Apple computers, iPod, iPad, iPhone, etc. books like this. I just scanned through it to see what made him tick, and then I found it. He said, the non-stop pursuit of wealth will only turn a person into a twisted being just like me. Then he goes on, aside from my work, I have little joy. Wow. Billionaire, but a life of fulfillment? No way. Now, in Germany, in World War II, there was a doctor called Victor Frank, who was a prisoner in the Auschwitz concentration camp. Now, until I'd been in, um, World Vision sent me to Poland to do some leadership training some years ago, and I wasn't aware that Auschwitz is actually in Poland, not in Germany. And I went to that terrible camp where they've just left it as it was when it was liberated. And uh, what an experience that was. And um, I had little sleep that night. But while Victor Frank was there as a prisoner, he began to notice that people most likely to survive the camp had something in common. And this is what he wrote in his book, After the War. The people who survived knew that there was a task waiting for them to fulfill. Those who had a why to live could bear almost any how. You get it? The people who survived knew that there was a task waiting for them to fulfill. Those who had a why to live could almost bear any how. Now, God has revealed to each of us a purpose, a purpose for our Christian life, a purpose through which we can bring empowerment to his harvest. He has a specific role that he wants you to play, and I, it's my prayer that as you, you grow as a church, each of you will find your place, your place of service that will match your giftedness, will match your passion, and this will bring a dynamic uh, element to, to the church, a dynamic factor to your, to your growth. That he will empower the harvest where he has placed you with whatever he has given you. Amen. And that's my prayer for you today, that, that you'll become excited, motivated, and expectant for the coming year as you become Christ-centered in him, through him, on him, under him towards him. And you know the fulfillment of a life aligned with him, with Jesus, with Jesus, our coming king. So why don't you just read with me some of that prayer that we prayed before. Let's read. His offices are manifold. His reign is righteous. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for your revelation that you've given us, Lord. And we pray that as we journey on, as we move forward, Lord, that you would be the center of all that we are and all that we seek to do. I pray your blessing on this fellowship. I thank you for the vision, for the drive, the energy, the commitment, Lord, of these early workers as they establish this place. May it be a place where you're honored, Lord, where your word is preached, Lord, where the gospel is powerful, Lord, and there's a turning to you in this part of the city, 
as people come in and find the reality of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit as the means of their empowerment, their giftedness, Lord, and finding their fulfillment and purpose in life. So bless these people, I pray. Bless all those who will join them, I pray. Lord, bring in people who will add something to this church. I pray in Jesus' wonderful, incredible name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.